Welcome to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we trade in personal finance advice for entertaining conversations about money, millennials, and the young at heart. Welcome, welcome world to yet another episode of Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where I am joined by my capable, incredible co-host, Mr. Malcolm. I appreciate all those superlatives, man. Man, you know I got them in the bag. (laughs) How are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm good. How how about you? I'm doing okay. I didn't have the greatest day. Okay. In that my You look like you had a story to tell. Just a little bit. My entire day was composed, in terms of eating, of all fast food. Okay. Which I'm, I'm kind of loathe when that happens. This morning I had McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Sasha's egg and well, wait, no, not I don't, not the McGriddle. What's the other thing? McMuffin. McMuffin. Okay. Large orange juice and the hash really brown. Really gonna categorize categorize all this. Okay. Yes. I mean, catalog all yes. this. Yes. Then for lunch mm-hmm. I had a bacon burger with French fries. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and then. I went to one of the establishments that's been in a chicken war of sorts, <laughs> and I had a salad. Okay. And I thought I was gonna allegedly get, you I, had a salad. I did. I did. Chicken war. I okay. did. I thought I was gonna get out, but I got pulled back in for a milkshake, <laughs> and it was just like this whole day. Now I know which one you chose. Right. Clearly. Um, but you know what I thought? As a parent of triplets, mm-hmm. you don't get a lot of joys in term, other than the smile on your kid's face. Mm. So bacon burger dogs is the place. There you, you go. You know what I was thinking when you were leading that up? Uh-huh. You sounded a lot like a Jill Scott song <laughs> where she's like jumped out of bed, toast, scrambled eggs, <laughs> all that on the side. Uh-huh. That's what I, the, Chris, <laughs> like that song. I can't even remember what that song is called. But that's what I was picturing while you were cataloging all this food this whole time. I did indeed take you on a long walk around the park oh my God. after dark. Please don't. Indeed. Well, uh, on this episode of Manage Your Damn Money, uh, we were talking about understanding the business of commercial real estate investing, which we've been kind of binging again, Malcolm, on the concept of investing in recent episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to get into this. It's what the people want. Absolutely. It's what the people, hey, it's what the people. It gets the people going. It gets the people going. <laughs> there we go. Uh, if we're going to talk about commercial real estate and what it takes to invest in commercial real estate. Um, but before we do, Malcolm, some interesting news that is of, you know, current. Apple, the company, recently released their Apple card, mm-hmm. which was a whole lot of hoopla. It was Apple and Goldman Sachs, which right. is a bank that combined. I think half the project was at Goldman Sachs, half the project was at Apple, where they have a card that doesn't have numbers. Right. Doesn't physically exist. Doesn't physically exist. They give you like a little cute. It lives in the app, the wallet app on your iPhone. And so the card is just connected to your phone. Right. So the card is just a cute representation right. of what. So you've got to use Apple Pay. Right. Okay. So it's an Apple Pay extension, essentially. Essentially. That's pretty and looks like other Apple products. But you get to join the club. And, right. Yeah. So, what, so, when, so when Apple released or made mention of the fact they were going to release this, what was like your initial thought? You know, I'm always skeptical of companies trying to get their eyeballs in my wallet right. and in my pocket. Right. And this just feels like that again. Okay. Like, Apple to date has always done a very good job of pounding the table and presenting itself to us as a company that, yeah, we collect a little data, but it's always for your own good. Mm-hmm. We protect your privacy first and foremost. We don't sell you out to anybody because we care so much about the integrity of our platform, right. the iOS platform. Right. This to me feels like a step in the wrong direction uh, in the sense that I feel like you're kind of trying to sell me out to Goldman Sachs. They can harvest your information. You can harvest my data on my purchases. You right. can get access to like my credit history now because right. I imagine they hadn't released exactly what the credit score is you have to have yeah. to qualify for the Apple card. Right. But the way they explained it when I saw this on CNBC was it's for the Apple phone, Apple iPhone consumer. <laughs> when they asked about credit scoring. Uh-huh. Well, uh, that basically means it's for the top tier, right. top echelon consumer 
who can, who can afford, afford a $1,000 cell phone just because the wind is blowing. And presumably has a credit score that matches that condition. Whatever that is. Right. So now we're saying, to me, that's Goldman Sachs's clientele right there. That's right. who they want. Right. And so uh, they're also bringing in that bank who to me their vested interest is not the interest they're going to make on charging you for purchases right their interest is getting into your history getting into your information on the front end mm -hmm. so that they can figure out a way to rope you into being a client on the back end uh, and they've got all this data to right. create all these nudges along the way to make it happen you're always connecting the dots for me on this show malcolm I, as a the resident skeptic <laughs> on this show it is my job to figure out where's the down where's the gotcha right i didn't think about that at all um i will say the thing that it kind of struck me as when i first saw it um because it's a pretty it, it struck me as like another apple product mm -hmm. that really wasn't anything all that different um i think Apple, you know, they do a great job of making things that work functionally and all that stuff. The iPhone obviously was a kind of revolutionary, so to speak, product. Mm -hmm. And they've done that a couple times here and there over the last like decade plus. But this feels like one of those things that like they're presenting it as the iPhone, mm -hmm. but it's really like just another okay. iteration. It's, it's like, yeah. okay, like, all right. And then to your point, it has a lot of implications in my mind when it comes to a company that's been traditionally focused on the hardware and software into a whole nother space where they can make more money. Well, Apple has said that they are focusing their efforts now on services way more than hardware. Okay. It used to be the other way around. They right. were a hardware company first and foremost. Right. And now they're actually focusing their effort intentionally on services, which I have a feeling they may end up acquiring one of these TV companies that right. has been giving them so much heartache. Right. They have the Apple uh, iTunes. It's like a new platform. Apple Music uh, yeah. platform. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling because people don't care as much about Apple Music as they would like, they may end up buying one of their competitors to right. try and scoop up some people that way. So they're trying to get into all those different services like Amazon, right. who's got their tentacles into like literally everything. Mm -hmm. I think Apple's trying to figure out ways to compete with Amazon. Amazon created a credit card last year, oh. rolled that out. Didn't know that. And now Apple's saying, oh, we can do that too. Right. The difference between the two, though, that I think the real interesting part, I still won't sign up for it, but the part right. that makes it interesting to me is that Apple doesn't actually give you a card number. Right. You don't have a 16-digit card number in the CCV or CVV, right. whatever that three-digit code is. That's part of the is. sexiness of, the, of, of it. It randomly generates a new number every time you need to buy something. Oh, wow. So your card, presumably, can't get compromised wow. because Apple's giving you a new set of numbers to use every single time. Interesting. That makes it interesting to me, except the credit card that I already carry in my wallet mm -hmm. gives me that option anyway. Oh. So when I buy online, they can generate a random number via the app okay. to let me buy that pair of shoes or whatever online instead of using my real number. <laughs> so Apple's kind of late to the party in that regard, but that's the only thing to me that's like super attractive about it is the security. Okay. Well, that was an interesting thing that we thought we'd talk about just off the top of our heads on this episode. Um, but as we do on every episode of Manage Your Damn Money, it is now time for headlines. Dun -dun 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 uh, a group of, oh, excuse me, that's the wrong headline. The right <laughs> headline, clients want to work with female advisors and firms are taking notice. This was a Wall Street Journal piece by Veronica Dogger. Um, over the past two years, Jane, Schwar uh, Jane Schwartzberg, head of strategic client six segments at UBS Group AG's U.S. Wealth Management Unit, has seen a market increase in requests for prospective clients who want to work with female financial advisors. It's not that women make better advisors, said Ms. Schwartzberg, who oversees the firm's marketing efforts to women, business owners, and business owners and wealth inheritors. It's the prospect, the, it's that prospects are now more vocal that they want diversity from the people they get advice from. In part, she said, societal conversations about gender issues are prompting these prospective clients to speak up about their preferences. Financial advisory firms are responding to client demand. At, U, at UBS, one of the biggest U.S. brokerages. The ranks of female financial advisors have increased 20.9% 20, 20 of its total advisory force worldwide, or 2,100 advisors from 18.6% in 2011, the firm said. Other firms in the industry are taking action. In 2019, one third of the roughly 3,500 employees in, Mer in the Merrill Lynch Wealth Management Advisor Training Program in the US are women, the highest percentage in the unit's history and one that is increasing yearly, the company said. Now, Malcolm, uh, this is an interesting story, and I, I think for you, 
hits pretty close to home. Talk about where the makeup or the industry was in terms of gender equity or diversity when you entered the business mm -hmm. and however long ago that was to where we are today. So super interesting as I'm reading through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the first thing that jumped out to me was the stat you read that at Merrill Lynch, a third of their training class is women. Yeah. A third of their training class that's like 30 whatever hundred people. Right. So over a thousand of them are women. Right. That's huge okay. to me. Okay. So as you know, I started my career at Merrill Lynch way back when. Right. And when I was going to the different meetings and events and stuff for like our training program, whatever, mm -hmm. I maybe saw three or four. Because you went through this exact yeah, same Yeah, I went thing. through the exact same training program that they're talking about. And I, I like literally at all of our national meetings and like training events and everything, right. I saw like three or four. Wow. I saw three or four different ones the following year. Ah. Then after I graduated the training program, we still had like trainees in the office and all that kind of stuff. So right. I saw different ones the following year right. and then the next year. And so they stayed for maybe a year. Uh, for whatever reason, they exited the business. Right. They went and got another one because we got to check the box. Right. We got to look like we're actually trying to improve <laughs> right. and bring in people. So over a thousand at one time right. is like super impressive. Mm -hmm. I just hope they stay. Right. That's really immediately as I got high on that roller coaster. Right. I thought about it and I was like, Retention. I just I, I just hope they stay. Retention is an issue. The article we went on to read. As of the end of 2017, only about 14.3% of financial advisors in the U.S. were female, according to research consult, a research consulting firm. Uh, despite industry efforts to recruit more female advisors, the number of women in the profession has been roughly flat over the past three to five years. A lack of awareness about the financial advisor role and an aversion to what has traditionally been a sales-driven culture has kept some women away, Malcolm. So when we think about the wealth management space as a career mm -hmm. and managing finances for individuals, and wealthy individuals, what are specific barriers you see first to like women getting into the business specifically, and then also other like underrepresented groups like minorities and the rest? Right, because it's the same problem. Right. So you mentioned like, I don't remember what the percentage is, but it's super low the number of women that are in the business. It's like immensely less than that for black and brown people. Right. Like I think, so I'm actually on the board of the Association of African American Financial Advisors, so I see this research flying around all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 1.1% or oh, wow. something of all of the financial advisors like in the business mm -hmm. are black. Oh wow. And like 1.8% are Latino. Oh wow. So it's like super, super low, and then if you think about add woman to one of those two <laughs> categories I just gave you, right. and it's like a fraction of a fraction. Right. So there's a long way to go mm -hmm. to, to the point that you know, you're know you making, but I, I do think it's a good thing that we're finally in a place where we're having this conversation and people are not shying away from the conversation. Because right. 10 years ago, or uh, just shy of it, I've been, I was going to things and people would bring up the case for gender diversity and even racial diversity and people would say, tell me why I even need to worry about that. Oh, wow. Literally, like that wow. was the conversation. Tell me why I need to even worry about that. Right. Now I go to conferences and the conversation is, well, where, where do we find Where them? are these people? Where do we find those people? If right. you would hire those people, then we could work with those people essentially. Right. And at least that's an evolution of the conversation sure. away from why should I care or why should I bother to uh -huh. help me help you basically. Right. And my last question for the both of us, I guess, before we go to uh, our first music break, um, how did you how did you become aware of the wealth management profession? Like it does feel like an obscure kind of thing to do, and certainly is not something that's advertised in general culture. Mm -hmm. So how did you come across it, and how what made you feel like I can do this? Um, well, for one thing, because I literally like just feel like I can do whatever I want. <laughs> like I mean, like literally, to like, start. Yeah. I can do it. Uh -huh. But um, my mom had a financial advisor oh, wow. who happened to be the son of one of her coworkers. Okay. That's it. Wow. So exposure is, to your point, the really key challenge that we have in the industry is that, like, I have conversations with groups of students now mm -hmm. who have no idea what a financial advisor does. Right. So there's that. You first just have to educate people on the fact that this exists, exists as a profession that they can aspire to. Right. But then also when they get there, it's discouraging if I'm the only woman in the room and there's a hundred men. Right. Or I'm the only 
black guy in the room or Hispanic guy in the room and there's a hundred non, you know, nobody else looks like me. Right. So that's one huge burden that, you know, it's prevalent. Like it just, it doesn't really go away. Right. And so then the flip side of the conversation is like, representation matters and just making sure that people understand that part of it. Right. But I think to the point you made leading up with the story, the fact that clients are starting to not just request it, but require it, right. is kind of making that change happen faster than probably it would have on its own. Because now people are voting with their dollars, so to speak, and that tends to change behaviors. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I remind people you can always catch past episodes of our show as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Please, please, please leave us a review or a comment on any of those platforms. That helps more people catch our show. If you have any questions, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. And of course, you can follow us on social media. My handle's at MYDM1. Malcolm, what's yours? At Malcolm on Money. And of course, that's on Twitter and on Instagram. And you can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back. Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm. We're on this episode, we're talking about understanding the business of commercial real estate investing. Most of us are familiar with the idea of buying a home and renting a room or a basement living space to pull in extra cash. Many also are familiar with the concept of owning and renting a secondary home to tenants and possibly replicating that model over and over again. But not nearly as much is known about what it would take to buy renovate or develop multi-unit apartment buildings, an office building, or even a hotel. In this episode of Manager Damn Money, we are taking a look at the lesser known world of commercial real estate investing. Malcolm, uh, this is an interesting topic. I think so. This, I mean, it's another investing topic. Yeah, it, th this is definitely one of those <coughs> things where, or those areas of spaces, when you talk about investing, that is theoretically and always thought to have been reserved for people with like boatloads of cash. Um, it generally is. It generally is. I mean, commercial real estate is not cheap, so it definitely requires a, a great deal of investment, but we thought we'd take a look at it nonetheless. Um, so first of all, we have to define what commercial property actually is, mm -hmm. and that definition is brought to you of, or brought to us, of course, by our favorite website, investopedia.com. Uh, commercial property refers to real estate property that is used for business activities. Commercial property usually refers to buildings that houses businesses, but it can also refer to land that is intended to generate a profit as well as a larger residential rental properties. The designation of a property as a commercial property has implications on the financing of the building, the tax treatment, and the laws that apply to it. 
Um, commercial property includes malls, grocery stores, office buildings, manufacturing shops, and much more. The performance of commercial property, including sales prices, new building rates, and occupancy rates, is often used as a measure for a business activity in a given region or economy. Uh, Malcolm, so can you think of like commercial real estate property or things that people run into on a daily basis? Well, so I think, so part of the reason I, I, I thought this conversation was important, at least, was because a lot of times, to your point, like people think very big and grand when it comes to talking about commercial real estate. Right, they think like a building in New York or something. Right, but I have multiple clients who own commercial real estate, but mm -hmm. it's like a five, six, 10 unit apartment building. Right. Or they own like the coffee shop uh, and the, the office space above, above it, it right. and it's like, you know, 3,000, 4,000 square feet, right. but it's technically commercial real estate. Right. And so it's definitely possible for the average quote unquote person right. to own commercial real estate. It's just not necessarily what people think about when you use the term. Right, absolutely. And I think it's instru it'll be instructive too for us to talk about the difference between investing in residential mm -hmm. real estate versus commercial property. Um, but before we talk about that quickly, do your, you, you mentioned your clients have um, you know, different kinds of commercial real estate situations, which aren't necessarily the big grand pieces. You know, how do people, at least when you talk to them about it, how are, how are they introduced to the concept of it? Is it like stuff handed down, information handed down? Usually. Okay. It's usually a parent owned a business, then the parent thought it was important to own the land under the business too. Ah. They bought the building mm -hmm. and then passed the building on to the kids. Ah, I see. That's usually what I like for specifically one client I'm thinking about, their parents owned a grocery store. Okay. And then they bought the the actual like physical unit that the grocery store was in okay. because the landlord was going to sell the ah, building away. Right. And they're like, well, we might as well buy it to right. make sure that we can control how much this thing costs. Right. They passed away, passed that on to their kids, and mm -hmm. one of them just so happened to get so inspired that like that became his thing. Oh wow. So it's usually that, like it's a generational thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the difference between investing in residential versus commercial property, from an investment perspective, commercial property has traditionally been seen as a sound investment. The initial investment costs of the building and costs associated with customization for tenants are much higher than residential real estate, but overall returns are also higher. And some of the common headaches that come with tenants aren't present when dealing with company and clear with a company and clear leases. Um, commercial property investors can also utilize the triple net lease where the risks are passed on to the leasing businesses. Um, and then also, Ma uh, Malcolm, there's something called REITs, which mm -hmm. are real estate investment trust. Um, and that's a way that people, uh, maybe you can talk about real quickly what a REIT is and how you can invest in real estate without actually going to buy building A on Main Street, so to speak. So essentially a real estate investment trust, it, it can either be what's called listed or unlisted. So right. you ask the simple question, but I don't have a simple answer. Okay. So you can either buy it like on a major stock exchange, the right. same way you do a stock or an ETF, it's got a three or four letter symbol. Right. You buy that, or you could actually have a, what's called a non-listed REIT, where basically the cost to get in is a lot higher than it is if you go right. to the exchange. Right. But nonetheless, what the real estate investment trust does is take dollars in from you, dollars in from me, dollars in from all the folks in the studio, right. and combines all of that cash mm -hmm. to then go buy multiple uh, factories, buildings, office spaces, malls, all that kind of stuff. Right. And instead of owning them, renovating them like HGTV style, and flipping them right. and then returning you a profit, they buy those buildings, make them look pretty, bring a tenant into it. Each month the tenant pays a certain amount in rent. Right. They return you a proportional amount of that rent as your monthly dividend check or your interest payment. Right. And that is the income that comes from that real estate investment trust. And right. it's meant to be held for forever right. into perpetuity. And you just continue to collect that interest payment that comes from all those multiple rent checks that come in. Right, right, right. Um, we're gonna take a quick music break in a second, but I did wanna ask, you You owned your first home when you were in college. Right. You bought a house down in North Carolina. Um, and I wonder what lessons you learned from having that house and eventually moving out and renting it. Mm -hmm. what, what can be applied in that much smaller scale situation 
to commercial real estate. You just made my blood pressure go up like, <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> I learned so many lessons, unfortunately, on accident. Uh -huh. So to be clear, though, I never went into it with the intentions to be a landlord. Uh -huh. right? So you got to put yourself back in where we were. This mm -hmm. was 2007. Right. The housing market, you couldn't lose. Right. right. People were running around with eight, 10, 12 properties at a time, and they right. were like a bartender or something. <laughs> and the market just kept going straight up. Right. So the psychology was... I'll live in the house, I'll get in-state tuition. When I graduate, I'll sell the house. Even if I don't make money on it, it who cares? It was worth it because I got in-state tuition. Right. Then 2008 comes. You were a smart the kid. The bottom falls, I, you know, yeah, I, I, I like to tell people that. <laughs> but then the bottom falls out of the market the uh -huh. following year and I'm left with this asset that I can't do anything with because who's buying houses? Which is what happened. And so I became a landlord on accident right. for over 10 years. Oh, wow. And so I learned a lot of lessons in the sense that like, you've got to have a cash cushion for the tenants right. because they inevitably will wreck your stuff. Right. You've got to have a cash cushion for whatever happens in the months where there is no tenant or uh -huh. that tenant doesn't pay their rent. Right. All those kind of things that then fall on you, right. which is actually leading me to one of the points that I wanted to make sure I made, which was that the biggest difference between owning one residential property or two or three, like mm -hmm. you said before, and owning a commercial building where maybe you have 10 apartments or something in there is the fact that your whole revenue stream is tied to that one person or family. Right. So if I own a house, I rent that house out, the more the rent on it is a thousand dollars, let's say, and the mortgage is nine hundred dollars. Right. My ability to pay that nine hundred dollars solely lies on you, what you have going on, right. whether your job is stable, right. if you decide to pay me or not, all those different things. Right. Whereas if I own a multi unit building, Maybe I need four of my tenants to pay their rent to out of 10. To actually pay what you owe. To actually pay back the bank what I owe on the bill. Maybe I need five of them. Right. So 50% occupancy means everything else is positive. Oh, wow. You can't do that in a single family home because right. you can't put five families in one house and charge them rent. Right. So there's the real big trade off that you get from owning commercial real estate. Very interesting piece there, sir. We're going to take a, uh, another quick music break, um, but when we return, we will continue to talk about understanding the business of commercial real estate investing. Um, I want to remind you, you can catch past episodes of our show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, and anywhere else where you listen to podcasts. Of course, you can also please leave us a review on any of those so that more people can catch our show. If you have a question you want us to answer or a topic you want us to cover, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. You can always follow us on Twitter or the Gram. My handle is at MYDM1. Malcolm, what's yours? At Malcolm on Money. And of course, you can catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash manager damn money. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back.
Welcome back to Manager Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we are talking about understanding the world of commercial real estate investing, Malcolm. And the first thing, there's another story that we pulled for this uh, particular show, which reads, The Seven Steps to a Hot Commercial Real Estate Deal. This is a February 2017 piece on Investopedia.com by Brian O'Connell. It reads, commercial property owners love the additional cash flow, the beneficial economies of scale, the relatively open playing field, and the abundant market for good affordable property managers and the bigger payoff from commercial real estate. Like most real estate properties, success starts with a good blueprint. Here's one to help you evaluate good commercial real estate property deals. Um, so first, Malcolm, on the list of this particular story, learn what the insiders know. For example, know that commercial property is valued differently than residential property. Mm -hmm. Income on commercial real estate is directly related to its usable square footage, and that's not the case with individual homes. Um, you'll also see a bigger cash flow with commercial property. Um, and then, of course, on the next actual item, it says, learn to recognize a good deal. The top real estate pros know a good deal when they see one. What's their secret? First, they have an exit strategy. And this is an interesting thought, Malcolm. The best deals are the ones where you know you can walk away from them. It helps to have a sharp landowner's eye, always be looking for damage, damage that requires repairs, know how to assess risk, and make sure to break out the calculator to ensure the property meets your financial goals. I think that's probably the biggest uh, out of the seven, like when I was reading through them. Uh -huh. Actually taking the time to, because it's easy on a residential property mm -hmm. to look at it and say, okay, it's in this particular place. Right. It looks like it has been upgraded in the last five years. Right. Buyers want to live here. Mm -hmm. It's got the so-and-so that people will get emotionally invested in love. Right. There's no emotion in commercial real estate. Right. So people don't care about your nice new faucets that you just installed or your right. granite countertops. You've got to sell them on the square footage, the foot right. traffic, all those kind of things. And mm -hmm. those are the numbers that you really have to master right. in order to make sure that it's worth putting the time and money into it. Absolutely. Another item on this list was get familiar with key commercial real estate metrics, um, net operating income, also referred to as NOI. Um, the NOI of a commercial real estate property asset is calculated by evaluating the property's first year gross operating income and then subtracting the operating expenses for the first year. Um, you want to have a positive NOI. Um, and then also you have to discover the fine art of neighborhood farming. Uh, an excellent way to evaluate commercial property is to study the neighborhood it's located in by going to open houses, talking to other neighborhood owners, and looking for vacancies, Malcolm. And again, that is one of the tougher parts mm -hmm. because if it's a really good deal, right. you don't have a whole lot of time to make your determination. No, not at all. So you've got to evaluate all the factors you just said, right? Mm -hmm. I care most about foot traffic. Right. But then how much time do I have to actually sit in my car and watch the people walking by and the whatever else that goes along right. with it? So it's this delicate balance of like heart and head. Right, right. And, I, and I also know too about the commercial real estate space because I work in the commercial real estate space um, in my day job. And that whole world is like a whole nother like group of folks who operate in these spaces. Mm -hmm. and, and they're very regional heavy, like who's doing commercial real estate in Dallas is different than the group of people who are doing it here in DC. Right. But nevertheless, all of the a lot of the deals and the way that deals go happen as a result of just connections and conversations. And if you're not privy to those at all, right. there's no door that says go through here to get to commercial real estate, which is a huge interesting uh, challenge when it comes to kind of breaking into a space like that. And if somebody's advertising it to you that way, that's a really good indication that something's wrong. <laughs> this deal has probably been picked over a few times and folks decided to pass. Right. And now they're advertising it on Facebook or something right. like blinking lights, like, right. hey, come get on, come get in on this deal. Right. So what are some of the other barriers that you see? I mean, obviously, exposure is one. Not knowing that it's a thing that you can do is another. Um, what are some of the other barriers to commercial real estate investing? Well, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying when you asked me, like my clients who own commercial properties, how they got to it in the first place. Right. It's the decisions of your ancestors that got you in this place to right. begin with. In a lot of cases, right? Obviously, there are people that go out there from scratch and build themselves a real estate empire mm -hmm. and ride off into the sunset. But there's so few and far in between. Right. It's very much a family business. Right. It's kind of like, have you ever watched one of those old New York mafia movies where you got like the five families who all run New a York City, area. for example. Right. DC commercial real estate is a lot like that. It is. 
or New York, commercial real estate is a lot like that. And right. so you have these cities where families who were there first mm -hmm. and decided we're going to buy the buildings and we're going to buy the construction company and we're going to all that kind of stuff. Right. Those families own that space right. and they're constantly like, you know, I'm being dramatic, but they're constantly battling it out for turf, so to speak, just like the mafia families in the 20s and 30s right. that were like fighting over square footage in New York City. Right, right. Um, so when we think about solutions to that problem, though, what are some smaller types of commercial real estate pieces that people can get started with when they're not handed a piece of real estate, commercial real estate, from their grandparents or from their parents? Well, I think part of it is like actually understanding that you don't have to go it alone. Mm -hmm. Like we mentioned ah. real estate investment trusts, which are a lot more formal structured right. businesses that are designed to take in large swaths of dollars from investors and invest it for the long term. Right. But then that had to start somewhere. Why can't I call nine of my friends and say the 10 of us are gonna put our dollars together and buy this right. you know, apartment building that's got 10 units down mm -hmm. the street from me? Mm -hmm. And that way it lowers the burden on me right. to invest those dollars to get into the building. Right. It lowers the downside risk for everybody involved, but then also you get a chance to get a taste of investing in real estate right. that you probably wouldn't have otherwise because like like I said nobody's just getting on Facebook saying I got a hot deal for you right and if they do they're the person that wants to sell me on like Herbalife or something <laughs> so like I think just personally crowdfunding it is one key way that you know you can kind of shake up that uh, history right and I know of actually uh, uh, my wife's cousin I believe or like a close family relative or something, someone who's connected. Somebody you hang out with a lot, I see. No, <laughs> no, I haven't seen him in a long time. But he told me about how when he was younger, he somehow bought like a four unit apartment complex somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think the story was he lived in one of them mm -hmm. and he rented the other three. And so he told me this, he gave me this whole like, it was a real casual explanation about it. Um, and it was the thought of, kind of starting small um, and it gave him the ability to actually put him he put himself in a position of expanding eventually if that's what he wants to do and then also having something that functions as a really strong asset for whatever he has for his kids and things like that but think about it from a practical standpoint real quick so there's a four units in mm -hmm. the building four apartments in the building right he lives in one of them mm -hmm. so I mentioned before that 40 to 50 percent occupancy pays the mortgage right if two of those apartments are rented at any given time right. he lives for free right practically that makes all the sense in the world I have no idea where the building is right, 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 how right. Qual what the quality of the neighborhood is all that kind <laughs> of stuff but just if you think about it in a practical sense right that makes perfect sense to me because now I get to live for free for however long I'm willing to live here right then when I finally get tired of living in this place maybe I do maybe I don't mm -hmm. and just get another tenant right like <laughs> Right, absolutely. Um, and then finally, one of the other ways that people do it, which is now a new, kind of a new thing where mm -hmm. there's crowdsourced investing in, it sort of functions like a real estate investment trust, um, but is a little bit more of a, a little bit of a different structure. Um, and then there's- I think the barrier to entry is a lot lower. Yeah. So like, for example, we did a show a few weeks back with Maureen who teaches a class on equity crowdfunding. Yes. So getting into startup companies mm -hmm. as a, a, I hate to say it this way, but like a low threshold investor. Right. Same thing with these funds you're talking about for real estate. Like right. I can't think of fundraisers, is that the name of one yeah, of them? Like it. companies like that where I can take $250 right. instead of $2 million like you would normally need to, to get into direct real estate investment that way. Right. Um, you're right, they're kind of new, mm -hmm. a novel concept. Makes some sense though. Right, absolutely. Well, um, hopefully you got some information there about commercial real estate investing on this episode. Um, as I do on every show, I wanna remind you, you can catch past episodes of Manage Your Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. And please leave us a review on any of, that plat any of those platforms. It helps more people catch the show. And if you have a question for us, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. And if you have want to follow us on social media, you can do so. My handle's at MYDM1. Malcolm, what's yours? At Malcolm on Money. And of course, that's on Twitter and on Instagram. You can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash manage your damn money. Once again, thank you to our partners here at Montgomery Community Media for their amazing hospitality. 
And as we always say, until next time, be good with your money. Peace. Peace.